A spokesperson for Tanzania's main opposition, Chadema Party, says it welcomes President Samia Suluhu Hassan's move to lift the ban on opposition rallies. The prohibition was imposed six years ago by the late President John Magufuli, but when rescinding the ban on Tuesday this week, President Suluhu Hassan said opposition parties can hold rallies if they inform the police ahead of time. John Mrema is Chadema's Director of Protocol, Communications and Foreign Affairs. He tells me that the end of the ban means that Tanzanians have regained their constitutional right of freedom of assembly, which had been denied them for the last eight years. He also said it will enable the opposition to directly reach their supporters instead of through social media as they have done in the past eight years. The announcement of President Samia Sulu Hassan yesterday that she has lifted the ban on political rallies, we have received it we know it is because of the long negotiations we had with her for the last seven months or so. And so we are glad that they have reached that angle. And it's an opportunity we've missed for so long to go and talk directly to our people in the villages. We were only using social media network to reach out to our people, but now this opportunity we are going to use it to reach our people directly now the president in lifting the ban on rallies said that uh, it is now the responsibility of the political parties to inform the government agencies during such gatherings how is this different from the past have you not been requesting permission from the authorities before uh, in our laws, specifically political parties law and uh, the police and auxiliaries act, political parties are supposed to inform the police 48 hours before any public rally. And this has been there even before 2015. It has been there since the introduction of multi-party politics in Tanzania, 1992. So this we are used to. And the reason behind is that so that the police, they can give a security to ensure that the political rally is uh, peaceful. So this is a, not a new thing. It's something which has been there since 1992 after the introduction of multi-party politics. We understand the political parties also had a meeting with the president. Can you shed light on some of the issues discussed with the president? Among the issues which were discussed is to uplift the ban on political rallies, the need to restart the project of new constitution, which was there up to 2014, when was suspended until today, and also the need to have a change of laws, particularly political parties' laws, police laws, election laws, and many other issues were discussed. And uh, we think, as the president promised that she's going to take care about it, she will form a committee and she will involve stakeholders, including political parties, on the reform on laws and getting a new constitution. We are expecting that she's going to honor her promise and then we can move forward as a one nation until we get a new constitution. So what do you think uh, the lifting of the ban on political rallies mean for Tanzania in terms of uh, moving forward for democracy in the country? The lifting of the ban on political rallies, it's an opportunity for Tanzanians because we have been denied this right, freedom of assembly for the last eight years because it was announced by the late President Magufuli in 2016. That's when the ban was introduced by the late President Magufuli. Until today, 2022, it is eight years without having this fundamental freedom of assembly, which is constitutional. So this uplifting of the ban will give us another chance as Tanzanians to meet, to have a freedom of assembly and to discuss various issues, political, economical and social issues which are affecting our people in political rallies. So we are going to utilize it very effectively so that we can form a more informed and democratic society because our people now have the chance to meet directly to discuss with their leaders on various issues. John Mrema is the Director of Communication, Foreign Affairs and Protocols for Tanzania's main opposition, Chadema Party. You are speaking with me from Dar es Salaam. Human rights groups in the Malawi Law Society are calling on President Lastro Chakwera to release the full report of the Commission of Inquiry that was set up to investigate the arrest of Anti-Corruption Bureau Director Martha Chizuma on December 6th. 
She was charged with committing an offense when she criticized the director of public prosecution in a leaked discussion with a third party. The director accuses her of defaming her, but the commission's 70-page report released on Wednesday is missing the first 49 pages. Michael Kayasa is the interim vice national chairperson of the Malawi Human Rights Defenders Coalition. He tells me that President Chakwera appointed the commission because he felt there was something of national importance that needed to be investigated. Therefore, he says, the public is entitled to see the entire 70-page report. Our concern as human rights organizations and civil society organizations in general was that the, the report was released in a piecemeal. The report was not released in full. There were some chapters that were missing. The report started from chapter 8 of the report and that raised concerns. What was the rationale you know, behind the, the decision to release the part of the report and not the whole report? Because the Malawians wanted to know what was the, in the report. So by releasing the report piecemeal, it you know, created an impression that there was something that government was hiding, and the Malawians were not happy about that. Chizuma was arrested last year, December 6th. Let's be specific. What does the report itself say about the reason why the Commission of Inquiry was set up? The full report has just been released and um, uh, we're still looking at it. But what the, the Commission is saying is that the, the DVP you know, abused his office by lodging a complaint, not in his personal capacity, but as DPP, because, the, you know, as DPP, he was not supposed to do that. What he was supposed to do was to lodge the complaint in his personal capacity as an individual and not using his office. The commission also looked at the, the conduct of um, the director of the ACP, especially in relation to the audio that was leaked, and the, um, uh, there were also, you know, the issues that they had found with that, that the, the director acted, you know, inappropriately, by disclosing information to a third party and have made recommendations on you know, how the issue should be dealt with. There were also issues raised with the police, the way the police had the handled the matter. For example, they are saying that the, the conduct of the police was the unprofessional. There were meetings that were held, but in no minutes you know, are available. Mr. Kaisa, let me ask you, given everything that is happening concerning corruption, what does your organization and the Malawi Law Association. What do you make of this whole process of uh, investigating the Director General of the Anti-Corruption Bureau? The way this uh, issue has been handled is raising a lot of um, suspicion, is raising a lot of questions, especially the way, you know, the arrest of Mark Kizuma was conducted. First of all, people are asking questions, why was he arrested? You know, especially at the time, when he, she was investigating senior government officials and other prominent politicians and business persons. Why was the, the arrest made at that time? There's a suspicion that the, the arrest might have been, you know, a way of um, diverting attention or even, you know, distracting in order to not proceed, you know, to effect those arrests. There's also a suspicion that um, this inquiry, which he was set up for the president, had a you know, hidden motive that he maybe what he, the Commission of Inquiry really wanted to find out was whether the conduct of um, the general general uh, was appropriate uh, or not. The president, uh, when he was establishing this inquiry, he told Malawians that the aim was to investigate you know, circumstances surrounding the arrest. But it seems that the, the Commission of Equality has gone beyond that to even you know, investigate the way the Director General has conducted herself, which is raising a lot of um, a, a suspicion that the, maybe this is a, you know, a ploy to frustrate her or maybe you know, to get her removed as Director General. Mr. Kayasa, thank you so much and a Happy New Year to you. Thanks for calling me. Happy New Year to you. Michael Kayasa is the interim vice national chairperson of the Malawi Human Rights Defenders Coalition. He was speaking with me from the capital, Lilongwe. Authorities in the Abia administrative area of South Sudan say 13 people were killed this week after an attack by a young man from Warap State. The authorities say five other people were injured and 27 houses were burned. The United Nations Interim Security Force in Abia said about 200 armed men carried out the attack. For VOA News, Waki Simon Wudu files this report from the capital, Juba. 
the attack was the latest in a series in Abia since early last year when a young man from the area began a clashing with the men from neighboring Warab state over a border dispute. Ajak Deng, the information minister in the Abia administrative area, says the Monday morning classes broke out when armed youth from Twitch County of Warab state attacked the area. They crossed the river and they have come and attacked the Nigeria to live most with women and uh, elderly people. So they killed uh, 13, among them three women and one girl. Deng says a number of people were displaced from their homes following the attack. The United Nations Interim Security Force in Abia or UNESFA confirmed the incident Monday, saying 13 people were killed and 27 houses burnt in a village called Romamir, 15 kilometers south of Abia Box. The statement says UNESFA is investigating what led to the attack. It also says the UNISFA troop presence has been enhanced in Romamir village and troops are patrolling neighborhoods to block potential armed groups. UNISFA's acting head of mission and force commander Brigadier General Abu Said Mohammed Bekir condemned the attack. He said it can only contribute to the tension and increase the risk of renewed violence in the area. Deng accuses one militia leader he could not name of leading their attacks. He has taken part because he's been accommodated there. He's been accommodated in Harvard by the people from Ajaxite, and he is a, and therefore he is uh, he aligned with them, and they are a fear of this attack, uh, and has been participating in some of the attacks um, in this. Uh, and this uh, war that has started since last year, so he has been a part of it. I don't know what is the reason. Why should they come and attack the civilians? William Wall, the Warab State Information Minister, calls the incident an isolated one. Although he denies reports that a militia group in Twitch led the attacks, he says chances are high that criminals are taking advantage of the state of insecurity and a conflict between the people of Twitch County and Abia. Uh, the governor of Arab State has urgently called a security meeting yesterday and he has dispatched a security committee led by a security advisor to the area for further investigation. Of course, in the area there between Twitch and, and, and Ngok, there has been a dispute and tension all along. But still, there are criminals who usually want to take this advantage of uh, this, this, this tension between the two communities. Eddie Moniakani is executive director of local group Community Empowerment for Progress Organization, or SEPO. He says empty youth from pastoralist communities across the country are increasing and are undermining the rule of law and the government's mandate to protect civilians. Yakani says President Salva Kiir should take responsibility. We have seen this incident that happened in Rumich, that happened in Mangala, that happened in Gumruk, and what's going on in Upper Nile and some incidents in Tonch East all shows clearly that armed cattle herders are telling the government they are powerful and they don't listen to the government and they undermine the constitutional obligation of the government. This is a serious uh, concern. Yakani says SEPO officials think some politicians, chiefs, military generals and spiritual leaders are involved in influencing and fueling the violence. For viewer news, I'm working Simon Udo in Juba. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, January 5th. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The U.S. House of Representatives adjourned until 8 p.m. Wednesday. This, after three additional rounds of voting in the chamber, failed to select a speaker, a prerequisite for the lawmakers to conduct any business of government. This story from viewers' chief national correspondent Steve Herman in Washington. 
The second consecutive day of the ordeal to select a House speaker began with the chaplain, Margaret Grun Kibben, asking for divine guidance. Even as we seek to establish this new Congress, remind us that we have a building not constructed by human hands. In our momentary distress, may we never lose sight of your divine hand that guides our own nation. Kevin McCarthy, a California Republican, saw a hard-line faction of his caucus continue to spurn him in the fourth, fifth, and sixth rounds of roll-call votes. Earlier, former President Donald Trump on social media called for lawmakers to vote for McCarthy, but it did not alter the outcome from Tuesday's initial three rounds. One of the Republicans opposing McCarthy, Colorado's Lauren Boebert, said Trump should instead pressure the Californian, supported by a majority of House Republicans, to abandon his quest. Even having my favorite president call us and tell us we need to knock this off, I think it actually needs to be reversed. The president needs to tell Kevin McCarthy that, sir, you do not have the votes and it's time to withdraw. Before departing the White House for a visit to Kentucky, President Joe Biden told reporters Wednesday morning the mess in the House is an international embarrassment. It's not a good look. It's not a good thing. It's the United States of America, and I hope they get their act together. Democrat Hakeem Jeffries of New York consistently has received the votes of all 212 Democrats, but cannot secure a majority with his caucus alone. Up to 20 of the most conservative Republicans have voted for other members of their party, denying McCarthy the majority of voting members needed to select the next speaker. The House Speaker is second in line to the presidency. Steve Herman, VOA News, Washington. The vicar of the Archdiocese of Gulu, Uganda, says the late Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI saw the Roman Catholic Church in Africa as the future of the Universal Church. Monsignor Matthew Odong says despite the clamor for modernity, the late Pope Benedict saw the traditional church on the continent as vibrant. Pope Benedict died on December 31st. His funeral will take place today, Thursday, at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Monsignor Odong tells me that the Catholic faithful will also remember Pope Benedict for his unwavering stance on established church doctrine. He was a man of God who loved the church and very convinced of his faith. So the church, the Catholic church, will miss him even if he had retired, but he stands on the doctrine of salvation will always be remembered by the faithful of our time. What do you see as uh, Pope Benedict's most impactful legacy on the church, particularly in Africa? Faithfulness to what the church believes and proclaims. Two, Pope Benedict saw African church as the future of the universal church. For him, the church in Africa is a very vibrant church. The church in Africa... He still maintains the original faith in most parts, apart from the modernism that is uh, trying to spread all over the world. But the legacy of Pope Benedict for the African church is seeing the future of the Catholic church is in Africa. So do you think, uh, Monsignor, the fact that Pope Benedict retired before he died, is that good for the church in terms of stability? Let us look at the intention of Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict showed that the modern world was developing, was moving so fast that he felt in his own personal conviction that especially this movement, understanding of what the church is, which is actually different from the conservative church. It was to do with modernism and conservatism. So I feel that Pope Benedict felt that he was not really the right person, you know, to manage this modernism. So he prayed that the Holy Spirit may give another person who can understand, but not in bad faith. Now, the question is, is it good for the church? Well, it depends on how one looks at it, because his position as the Pope is about the leadership, providing a strong leadership. And this leadership is supposed to proclaim, to defend, to explain, to interpret. For me, the intention was not a bad one. To say, okay, look. I'm in a situation where the wave, you know, is different from my expectation. Maybe somebody, a better person, could handle this modernism. That is why he stepped down. You mentioned modernizing the church. People have talked about whether it's time for priests to get married. 
Yeah, that was one of the controversial and remains a controversial subject. You know, there are school of thought which actually thinks that the priest should be allowed to get married, women should be ordained. These are some of the issues that Pope Benedict was confronted with. But for him, as a conservative person, say, no, let us go back to the original doctrine. What was the mind of Christ? Why did it not happen in the time of Christ? While the modern world is pressing for that, Pope Benedict stood his ground, say, no ordination of women, priests will not be allowed to get married. He stood for it until he died for it. Monsignor Odon, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and Happy New Year to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless. Happy New Year. Monsignor Matthew Odong is the vicar of the Archdiocese of Gulu in northern Uganda. The World Health Organization says China continues to withhold important genetic sequencing data needed to analyze and understand the global evolution of COVID-19 and the emergence of concerning variants and mutations. Lisa Schlein reports for VOA from Geneva. The WHO says China remains reluctant to share data essential for it to carry out risk assessments of the current state of the pandemic. It says the agency needs this information so it can adjust its life-saving advice and guidance. WHO officials have held a series of high-level meetings with their Chinese counterparts over the past few weeks. Despite that, They say they believe China still is underreporting the true impact of the disease, which is surging in the country. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus says the pandemic is on the decline. However, he warns COVID-19 remains a dangerous virus to our health, economies, and societies overall. We continue to ask China for more rapid, regular, reliable data on hospitalizations and deaths as well as more comprehensive real-time viral sequencing. WHO is concerned about the risk to life in China and has reiterated the importance of vaccination, including booster doses to protect against hospitalization, severe disease, and death. Tedros expressed concern about the current COVID-19 epidemiological picture characterized by intense transmission in several parts of the world and the rapid spread of recombinant variants. WHO COVID-19 technical lead Maria von Kerkhoff says the WHO is worried about a subvariant of Omicron known as XBB.1.5. She says that Omicron sublineage so far has been detected in 29 countries. It is the most transmissible subvariant that has been detected yet. Uh, the reason for this are the mutations that are within this recombinant, this subvariant of Omicron, um, allowing this virus to adhere to the cell and replicate uh, easily. Um, and we are concerned about its growth advantage. The more this virus circulates, she warns, the more opportunities it will have to change. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. And that's it for this Thursday, January 5th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for being our guest this morning. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa team, I am James Barton Washington saying, have a great day and please be safe. Whatever.